one of the most famous speeches in American history is Abraham Lincoln's The Gettysburg Address. And if you can't quite remember the Gettysburg Address, it's the one that goes four score and seven years ago. And I see the wheels turning for some of you guys. That speech was iconic for so many reasons. And it was given as a eulogy for the people who lost their lives at Gettysburg. Lincoln was just one of a few of the different speakers there that day. And what's fascinating is there is not a single photo taken of Lincoln actually giving the speech itself. There's photos of the event beforehand, but none of the actual speech. In fact, it wasn't until 1953 that there was even a single photo of Lincoln at Gettysburg at all. An archivist was going through old, old photos and documents, and he came across this very blurry photo. If you can spot Lincoln in there, it's not the guy in the top hat, so that you don't get a pass that easy. If you can spot Lincoln, you got pretty good eyes. We can zoom in a little bit, and you can see that is a very <laughs> blurry Abraham Lincoln but the reason that there was no photos of Lincoln given the actual speech itself uh, is because by the time he was done giving the Gettysburg Address, the photographer was still setting up the camera, which is just something you would never live down if you were a camera person, right? Like, oh, you're right, Gettysburg, you were the photographer, and just no photos of Lincoln. Never going to live that down, but we shouldn't give him too much flack because in those days, a eulogy could take anywhere from one to two hours to give. In fact, the guy who spoke before Lincoln used all of those two hours at Gettysburg. The reason there's really no photo of Lincoln giving the speech is that instead of the normal two hours given for eulogy, Abraham Lincoln was done in two minutes. So the photographer is still setting up because he thinks he has another hour and 58 minutes because Lincoln was able to consolidate his ideas down in such a concise and distilled version and the man who spoke before Lincoln said, you were able to communicate in two minutes what took me two hours. The best communicators are able to do just that. They can distill down their big ideas. And Lincoln's Gettysburg Address was more than just what he thought about Gettysburg. It was his thoughts on the Civil War, his hopes for the country. It embodied who he was as a president, all in just 10 sentences. That's as long as the Gettysburg Address is. Such a small speech, but it made such a huge impact. Jesus' most famous sermon is the Sermon on the Mount. It is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. People have said that it is a summary of the gospel. If you understand the Sermon on the Mount, you understand Jesus. And then people have said that the Beatitudes, which are those opening lines of the Sermon on the Mount, Beatitudes is about blessedness. Who does Jesus say is blessed? There too, what we find are 10 sentences distills down Jesus' idea of what the kingdom of heaven is all about. There's no time to take a photo. There's barely time to take notes. If you blink, you miss it. Jesus distills down the main ideas of the kingdom here in the Beatitudes. And so today we're going to explore these beautiful, impactful, and meaningful words that Jesus kicks off the sermon with. If we've not met before, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at the summit. And like Pastor Ryan said, we are beginning today with the Sermon on the Mount, walking through chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. And the Sermon on the Mount is an invitation to see the world as it truly is. It's like Jesus is saying, let me peel back the curtain to you for you and show you what is actually going on. It seems so simple on the first reading of the Beatitudes. It's like walking into the shallow end of a pool, step by step, Beatitude by Beatitude. You start to realize there's way more depth here than you ever anticipated. And before you know it, you're almost over your head if you really start to unpack what the Beatitudes are getting at. And here we're in Matthew chapter 5, and it's easy to forget uh, that Jesus hasn't actually done that much up to this point. He's only called four of his disciples so he sits down to give this speech and he's just beginning his ministry. And I love just kind of thinking about some of the rumblings that are beginning to happen here. Like people are saying, there's this rabbi and he's not like the other rabbis. He's not quite as educated and it's really embarrassing for the Pharisees because everyone wants to go hear Jesus speak, but no one's going to the rabbis and the Pharisees. It's, it's such a shame for them, but he speaks in a way that we all understand. He uses images that we're used to, agriculture and farming life. He's one of us. But there were some distinctions that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of my favorite parts of the sermon is you have the disciples, and you also, like always, you have the crowd. And you can find yourself somewhere in this group of people. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus, and you're like, if Jesus speaks it, I'm ready to follow it. You resonate with the disciples. 
You're like, whatever Jesus teaches, I'm ready to apply to my life. Or maybe you identify with somebody in the crowd. You're interested in Jesus. Maybe you're even kind of ready to take that next step, but not quite to the level of discipleship. Or maybe you would be in the back of the crowd, right? You're like, he's a great communicator. Like I wouldn't miss an opportunity to hear such a great communicator, but I'm not interested in any type of following. I'm still skeptical about this message. The Sermon on the Mount is for you. And all of us fall into one of those three buckets of types of people, close, a little farther away, or skeptical and watching at a distance. The sermon's for you. And when he kicks it off, or right before he kicks it off, he summarizes what he came to talk about. It's in Matthew 4, verse 17. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That word repent is a tricky one. For some people, it's like triggering. It is such a loaded word. And for some people, the image that comes up are just those people who like to use religion and Jesus in general as like a battering ram. They want to try to bludgeon people into the kingdom, not invite them into the kingdom. So you hear repent and you think the guy standing on the street corner. If that is at all you, if the word repent is tainted for you, I want to share with you something that a professor of mine said. It's so simple, but he said that To repent means to realign. To repent means to realign. It's to say, I know that I have strayed, I have sinned, I have have missed the mark, and I'm gonna now realign with what God says a human life is supposed to look like. That's what repentance looks like. So that's part one, repent, but the next part is the why. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom is breaking in. The curtain is being pulled back. This is actually what the good life looks like. Things are about to change because a new kingdom means a new king and a new king means new values. So things are gonna shake up. And the question just below the surface of the Sermon on the Mount is this, which life is the good life? Who do we say is successful? Who do we call blessed? Who do we say they really know what they want out of life? If I could model my life after anybody, it would be this type of person. We have so many competing ideas of what the good life looks like in our culture. And an interesting distinctive about the West is that we mostly value people for what they do, not who they are. But what do you do? What do you add to society? How productive are you? What are you doing to generate? What, what's your value in that regard? And we see really two major groups of people struggle because of this. Uh, It is adolescents and people in their post-working years. Because for so often we've said, your value comes by what you do. Here's a quote from Robert Mulholland uh, in his great book, Invitation to a Journey. He says this, I believe one of, one of, the underlying realities behind the epidemic of suicide among adolescents and senior citizens is that we're a culture that values people primarily for what they do. In our culture, a person's value, meaning, and purpose reside primarily in the nature of their work. And he's talking about teenagers here. And he says, and teenagers to us don't, quote, do anything, right? We've always said, oh, teenagers don't do anything. And it's like a a passing comment. But when we live in a society that says, actually, your value is mostly based on what you do, why are we surprised that teenagers often struggle with identity? Like, what? I don't do anything. And then if for most of your life, You've been identified and valued and lifted up because of what you contribute in your work, in your job, or whatever. And then that stops. It seems like your value then kind of also disappears. But again, the Beatitudes are an invitation to see the world as it truly is. And sadly, in our society, it's not about what people are. It's not about their being. But what do you do? What do you contribute? But the good thing is, what we see as a flourishing life is not always what God calls a flourishing life. Because we think the people who are flourishing are the wealthy, those who can climb the corporate ladder, the job creators, the ones who have it all together, the ones who have no questions about life. Like they know what they want to do, full steam ahead. They know what they want out of life. That's who we value. But just because we value them does not mean that's what is valuable in the kingdom of heaven. Recently, or not recently, but actually a while ago, my wife was reading this book by one of my favorite authors named Bill Bryson. Uh, He writes really phenomenal books. He wrote a book called The Body that has tried to help me get over my anxiety about thinking about blood. That's a different sermon topic there. Uh, He wrote a book called A Brief History of Nearly Everything that's phenomenal. And then the book that my wife was reading is called At Home. 
And he talked about how in the 1700s, sugar became more and more available to people, but still really expensive. And so primarily it was the most wealthy people who were able to have sugar. And they didn't know what to do with sugar. It's so funny to read about this. It reminds me of me in the kitchen. Like if it is not barbecue or frozen waffles, like I don't know what to do with the spices and all the other stuff. I'm like, ah. So when sugar is first introduced, they're just throwing it on everything. They're like, oh, you got a good ribeye? Throw some sugar on it. Got a good glass of wine? Sugar would make that better. They are actually just eating spoonfuls of sugar if they're able to afford it. And for them, that's the good life. If you're able to just eat spoonfuls of sugar in those days, it's like you must be doing something right because you have wealth. And since pretty much the beginning of time, we attribute wealth to the good life. Of course, uh, the side effect was and still is if you just endlessly eat sugar, Uh, There are some consequences. And what began to happen is that the most wealthy people who consumed all this sugar, their teeth started to turn black, right? It's not a shock. But the insane part about this is that black teeth then became a status symbol. (laughs) What is wrong with us? We have not changed that much. And so, yeah, so people began to see, oh, if you have black teeth, that means you can afford sugar. That means you're wealthy. That means you're living the good life. And the even more insane and ironic part is people who weren't wealthy but wanted to appear wealthy would then artificially darken their teeth black to appear like they were living the good life. And it's so easy to look back 300 years and say, that's insane. You think that's the good life? What's the matter with you? It's really difficult to do today. It's really difficult when we swim in our own cultural waters to say, I think we're just being duped because we can look back to 300 years ago and say, that is an insane idea. That's an insane way to live your life. But what are we being duped with today? What are we being sold today as the good life? That actually the kingdom of God would say, no, that's not what is valuable. Let me pull back the curtain and show you what's truly valuable. So the Beatitudes are a response. It's Jesus's response to ancient ideas and modern ideas about what the good life looks like. It's like God is saying, let me show you what is actually human flourishing because everything else is just painting your teeth black. So it's time for us to actually read the Beatitudes. And I think you'll see how these are such simple statements, but the more you sit with them, the more impactful they become. So it's Matthew 5, starting in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The actual Beatitudes themselves, the words of Jesus, just 10 simple sentences. But there's so much to unpack. And the thing I want to kind of get out of of the way to say is this. The Beatitudes are not a how-to guide. That's an easy way to read them and to think. uh, But if that were the case, it'd be like Jesus is saying, be persecuted and I will bless you. Or uh, just mourn a little bit more uh, and I will bless you. If that were the case, then it would just be one more coin to put in the divine vending machine that we call God. Just one little trick like, God, I've really been uh, hoping for righteousness recently. Can I get my blessing, God? I've really been very meek recently. I'm ready to receive my blessing yet. Uh, You promised if I was meek, I'd get a blessing, but that's not the case. And we can see this in the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Dallas Willard makes this point. He says, Jesus did not say, blessed are the poor in spirit because they are poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means you are impoverished with what you understand spiritually. So it'd be like God saying, forget everything you know about me and I will bless you. 
And what an insane way to think about it. But on face value, that's how we can read the Beatitudes. Oh, I just need to do all these things and I'll be blessed. But it's not like that at all. It is in spite of these things that God is saying the kingdom of heaven is near. To be spiritually poor means that these were people, and Jesus looks out, there are people who don't know anything about the Torah. No one's asking their spiritual advice. No one's coming to them for understanding about the things of God. They are forgotten. It's what Dallas Willard would call the spiritual zeros. No one's asking them. Today, it'd be people who, they they don't own a Bible. They would get lost on the way to Genesis. They don't go to church. They don't They don't know anything about what we think we know about God. And the great reversal that Jesus offers here is to say, actually, the people who know the least about me, the kingdom is near to those types of people. It's an invitation to see the world as it truly is. The kingdom is available to people, even if they don't know anything about God. So the question is, who does the world say is blessed versus who does Jesus say is blessed? In this moment, as Jesus gives his sermon, it's like you can imagine him looking out in the crowd and he knows some of these people. Some of them are his disciples and one he's already chosen. And even the strangers in the crowd, Jesus knows because he grew up in rural Galilee. He's like them. And he knows that they're people who they, they do hunger and thirst for righteousness because they're living in an occupied land. They're one bad day from Rome just taking all that they have. They know what it's like to mourn and to not actually see justice roll down. They know what it's like to try to keep the peace. They know what it's, what it's like to be spiritually impoverished. And Jesus is looking at it, all of them and saying, the kingdom of heaven is for you. You're broken, but the kingdom of heaven is for you. The kingdom of heaven is for you. I know your story. I know who you are. God's kingdom is near to you. The bottom line with the Beatitudes is this. The kingdom belongs to the broken. And it's good news for each one of us because all of us come into this room with parts of our lives that are broken. The kingdom doesn't belong to the spiritual know-it-alls, to the wildly successful, to those who have it all together, the most educated, the elite. The kingdom belongs to the people we would least expect to be in the kingdom. Jesus is challenging us to rethink what we think human flourishing looks like. And if you want to understand God's kingdom, you have to understand what he values in the kingdom. And recently I was listening to Tim Mackey. He is uh, one of the guys, a part of the Bible Project. He he shared this illustration, so I want to give him credit. Um, He shared some artwork from Tim Noble and Sue Webster. And uh, it was uh, art in a room, in a darkened room, and you would walk in to these rooms and you would see something like this. Here we have the first photo. And it's trash that has been shot through, uh, some things that could be recycled. And that's the first thing you see. But then they would add one additional element and you would see something completely different. All the elements were actually in place from the beginning, but when the light was added, uh, you saw what was always true the entire time. You were just missing one element of it. There's one more example. Uh, You can see uh, a pile of trash, someone who really liked McDonald's. And then you add the missing element uh, and you see what was there the entire time. And there's a lot of social commentary you could say about these pieces and they're meaningful. But to me, what I'm drawn to in these pieces is that it is a challenge to our perspective. It challenges us to say, what do I see when I first look out? And then what do I see when the right element is added? What do I see when the light is turned on? What is the greater truth? And it's like Jesus is saying, I know you see all these people who you think are spiritual zeros. They don't offer anything to the society. It's just basically what's left over. It's the trash, right? But the kingdom perspective is what happens when you turn the light on. That's when you begin to see the greater truth that is there. And so walking with Jesus is being willing to say, I see one thing, but what does God see in this situation? I see just something that's left over. It doesn't offer any value. It's not productive. But what does God see in these moments? Initially, we see something, but the kingdom, the kingdom perspective turns the light on. So with the Beatitudes, I think the question that we're left to ask is, what do we do with the Beatitudes? I said up front that these aren't commandments. God isn't saying, do this and you'll be blessed. So if that's the case, how are they supposed to impact us? Well, I think, one of the things that it does is it reminds us that God is a God of surprise. 
every, every story in scripture just about is God saying, oh, you thought this person would be raised up. It, it was the person who you least expected. Oh, you think the great nation is the one I'm, I would pick. I'm gonna pick Israel. You thought it was the oldest brother. I choose the youngest brother. And over and over again, God is a God of surprise. And that is great because if you feel like you've been forgotten, if you feel like socially you don't add the kind of value that, you, uh, that everybody else is looking for, it's great to know that God is a God of surprise because that means he does not see in you what the world sees in you. He doesn't see you just for what you do because that is exhausting. It is exhausting to try to constantly gain your worth just by what you do. In these opening 10 sentences, Jesus invites us to see the world as it truly is. Stanley Hauervoss um, was giving a sermon on the Beatitudes at his father's funeral. Stanley Hauervoss is a writer. He was a professor at Duke for a while. And he makes this really astute point. He says, too often the characteristics of the Beatitudes are turned into ideals we must strive to attain. Jesus does not tell us that we should be poor in spirit or meek or peacemakers. He simply says that many who are called into the kingdom will find themselves so constituted. Jesus does not begin the Sermon on the Mount with a list of commands, but with an invitation to change your perspective. Who do you call blessed? Who do you call valuable? Who do you consider worthy? And what happens when you turn the right light on and you see the light of God's kingdom, what changes? And it's an incredible thing because eventually we all get to a point where we're not doing what, the, what our culture considers valuable anymore. We get to a time, I won't preach my entire life. We get to a place with, where what you think makes you uniquely you will no longer be true anymore. And do, does your value just vanish in that moment? Socially, in a lot, of, a lot of ways, it does. But the good news of, of the kingdom is that it's not those things that make you valuable. It's not your doing that makes you valuable. And it's easy to think when we read these Beatitudes that they are just unrealistic. Like, how can the kingdom of God be close to those who are spiritually poor? They don't even know anything about God. How could a peacemaker be someone who God blesses. They're just indecisive. They stand in the middle. They never get anything done. That is not productive. Pure in heart, showing mercy, that's not practical in the real world. You get taken advantage of, so on and so forth. With each beatitude, we could respond with, well, that's not very practical. It takes courage to believe in Jesus's view of the world. But how much of a relief is it to know that your worth doesn't come from what you do? and that your brokenness is actually a place where God's presence can meet you. The big question from the Beatitudes to the end of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is asking is this, will you follow me? Because to follow somebody is to trust somebody and it's to trust that the way I see the world, the way that Jesus sees the world, I agree with that way. The people who we think are just leftovers, who don't contribute to society, who aren't productive, Actually, the kingdom of heaven is near to those types of people. So the next step, I think in this moment, is to ask yourself, do I at first, do I need to realign my life? Jesus' call to repent and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Is a call to us today still. Wise people constantly look to realign all parts of their life, the meaningful parts of their life with family, work, and relationships to say, have I drifted from my original commitment? I said I would do this thing. Am I still going in the direction I first set out on? Don't let your spiritual life be the one thing you just kind of let drift, assuming it will stay aligned. So today, we want to make space for this to actually happen. You know, most days I'm as introverted as they come, uh, at least that's how it feels. Um, so I know that to have a space here down front can feel intimidating, but creating an opportunity for you in this moment to actually say, I need to realign myself is important for us as a church. So here in a moment when uh, the band comes back out, myself, Pastor Ryan, and some members of our care team will be available for prayer. And maybe for you, it's about realigning your life. Maybe it is, um, I committed to God and I feel like, man, I just, I've let myself drift away. Or maybe it's first time. Maybe for the very first time you want to say, I, I want to align my life with, with what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. Or maybe you need prayer for something else. Maybe you need prayer for encouragement. Whatever it is, we'll, we'll be down front for you. 
The message of the kingdom is a beautiful image that God is close to the broken. It's an invitation for us to ask, who do you say is blessed? And is it time to say, God, I want you to turn the light on so what I think of as insignificant and not valuable, I wanna see it with your eyes. Who do you call blessed? These 10 sentences that kick off the Sermon on the Mount, they're a great invitation. And I pray that today you would not discard that invitation, that you would take the time as we close out the service to say, how do I need to realign my life? Because the culture's value system is exhausting and the Beatitudes show us that there is such a better way. Your brokenness does not exclude you from the kingdom. The kingdom of God was made for people who are broken. And that's good news.